My name is Jeff Waddington. I'm a senior lecturer in international history at the University of Leeds. And I'm going to speak today about the policy of appeasement as pursued by the British government during the 1930s. In fact, I'm going to make the case for appeasement. One of the most iconic images of the 1930s is that of Neville Chamberlain having just alighted his plane at Heston Aerodrome on the 30th of September 1938 when he addresses the assembled pressmen and brandishes in, hand, in his hand that piece of paper, the Anglo-German Declaration. It's become iconic for all the wrong reasons. It's the symbol of appeasement, a symbol of a poor, weak, unprincipled, sacrificing policy. It's been the butt of jokes. It's been applied to discredit political opponents and still is. Appeasement is a dirty word. It was in the immediate aftermath of the Munich crisis in 1938 amongst some of Chamberlain's opponents, but not many. Many people celebrated the Munich Agreement as a deliverance from the prospect, from the abominable prospect of another world war. There are problems with appeasement. There are problems of definition. Terms do matter. I'm going to outline four different definitions of appeasement which denote different meanings to the word. The first is relatively positive, and that is that appeasement was a policy of effectively buying time to enable Britain to prepare itself for a possible confrontation at a later date with the dictators. The second definition is benign and non-judgmental, and that is that appeasement was a policy of redressing grievances, legitimate grievances through processes of reconciliation and negotiation. The third definition is neutral, and it's non-judgmental also, and that, that is appeasement was a rational and measured response to a series of adverse circumstances over which the British government had relatively little control. And the fourth definition is highly pejorative and highly critical, and that is that appeasement was simply a policy of craven submission to dictators. It was a policy, effectively, of sacrificing your friends to your enemies. Well, appeasement is not purely a phenomenon the 1930s. Again, it depends on the definition, but interesting arguments have been advanced about Britain's policy, specifically towards Germany, towards the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. Because if appeasement is an attempt to redress grievances, to conciliate through negotiation, that's precisely, some people argue, what the British attempted to do with Wilhelmina, Germany, before the outbreak of the First World War. Primarily, however, of course, appeasement is associated with the 1930s. So I'm going to look now at some of the determinants, some of the roots, some of the causes of appeasement in an effort to make the case for appeasement as a policy. Before we get to the 1930s proper, some of the roots of appeasement indisputably stretch back into the 1920s. We can't underestimate the impact of the First World War on British society. This was supposed to be the war to end all wars, the levels of carnage that were experienced on the trenches between 1914 and 1918 were absolutely unprecedented. This was the first total war. All levels of society have been affected by it. It was also the war which saw the advent of air power, a new threatening and frightening aspect of modern warfare. So the impact of the First World War is one of the initial determinants of appeasement, the determination never to see that kind of tragic, and horrifying event again. A second determinant of appeasement, which has its roots in the 1920s, is also a sense of, of fair play and the redress of grievances which Germany had against the peace treaty of Versailles, which had been effectively imposed upon her by Britain, France and the United States and the Associated Powers in 1919. This took a while to take root, obviously, but there were also other elements, aside from a sense of fair play, that Germany had been treated too harshly in 1919. 
There was also a fear that if Germany continued to be treated as a pariah in the international community, that it might yet gravitate towards the Soviet Union, a new dangerous potential adversary for the British Empire in the 1920s. Indeed, in 1922, Germany and the Soviet Union signed a treaty at Rapallo. The third aspect of appeasement, which relates to the 1920s, is the expectation of new diplomacy, the expectation of the new internationalism, the expectation that international relations could somehow take on a different hue in the light of the experience of pre-1914 secret diplomacy. There was the League of Nations. The League of Nations was intended to arbitrate and settle international disputes before they progressed to war. That was the theory, anyway. This new diplomacy, this atmosphere around the League of Nations encouraged notions of peaceful conciliation, the peaceful redress of disputes and grievances. And the final determinant of appeasement relating to the 1920s relates to the British Empire itself. The empire had increased in size and therefore Britain's commitments had increased considerably after 1919. Effectively, the British now had too much to defend. That much was admitted in a Foreign Office state paper in 1926. We have effectively got too much, is what uh, the officials wrote. The calculation was therefore that because the British Empire sprawled across the globe, wherever war broke out, British interests would ultimately be threatened. And this obviously propelled Britain into attempts to negotiate peaceful settlements of disputes. Well, let's turn now to the 1930s themselves, the determinants of appeasement in the 1930s. First and foremost, the 1930s was a decade of economic crisis. The Wall Street crash of 1929 had not only decimated international trade and the world economy, but it had had a distinctly debilitating effect on the international system in terms of the fact that states became inward-looking. They became less attuned to notions of international collaboration. They began to look in on themselves and to concentrate on their own problems. Nowhere was this more so than Great Britain. The last thing Britain needed, therefore, were hefty international obligations or international complications. The second determinant of appeasement in the 1930s, obviously, is military deficiency. The state of Britain's national equipment in military terms was dire in the 1930s. Britain had effectively demobilised after the First World War and its air force, which in 1918 had been the strongest, was ranked fifth strongest in the early 1930s. Moreover, the economic crisis meant also that defence budgets were slashed the defence budget of 1931 to 2, for instance, was the lowest in the interwar years. Britain had also adopted, in the early 1920s, um, a defence ruling called the Ten Year Rule, which stipulated that defence estimates would be calculated on the assumption that there would be no major war for ten years, and this was made self perpetuating in the late 1920s. The effect of this was to make defence budgets increasingly low. There was also the element of public opinion. Public opinion uh, reflected a desire for pacification, a desire for international disarmament, a desire to see the new notion of collective security work. It was pretty much an act of political suicide for any British politician, in the early 1930s at least, to stand up and call for large-scale rearmament. So the British defence establishment in the 1930s, for a series of reasons, was not equipped to meet any major challenges. And this was something which dogged the British in their dealings with the rise of the aggressor states in the 1930s, because, in a sense, they were always playing catch-up. Thirdly, in the 1930s, the British encountered a series of multiple enemies 
1931, in Japan, quite out of the blue, quite unexpectedly, aggressed Manchuria and moved its operations to China proper, threatening British interests in Shanghai. From that point onwards, Japan had to be considered a potential enemy of Great Britain, whereas in the 1920s, she'd been effectively a fairly good friend. Then, in 1933, Hitler came to power in Germany. In the Foreign Office, the threat posed by Hitler to European stability was immediately recognised, but no effective policy was available to deal with it unless an attempt was made to conciliate Hitler, and this was attempted by the Foreign Office on three occasions in the 1930s, which we'll talk about later on. In 1935, Italy, which had formerly been fairly staunch friend of Great Britain in the 1920s. It was, for example, along with Great Britain, a co-guarantor of the Locarno Treaties. Mussolini decided to invade Ethiopia, or Abyssinia, and in doing so, incurred the wrath of the British, whose policy was at least nominally based upon the collective security of the League of Nations. From that point onwards, Italy also had to be construed as a threat the British Empire. There are also uncertainties about the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was regarded with deep suspicion uh, by the British establishment and its pernicious doctrines, Bolshevism, internationalism, Marxism, call it what you will, were considered to be an anathema to the notions of British liberalism, British democracy. Moreover, Britain and pre-Soviet Russia had had a series of disputes in the international sphere and there was no guarantee that these would now abate because the Soviet Union was engaged in internal reform. As far as having multiple enemies was bad enough, the British didn't have enough friends. Their main ally was France, but France was racked by internal crises in the 1930s. There were frequent cabinet crises, frequent changes of government, and on some occasions France was actually caught without a government during the Anschluss, for instance. The United States um, was relatively aloof. The United States wished really no part in European and international relations. The leader writer of the New York Times might abhor Nazism but the American government wished to stay neutral in any dispute. As Baldwin said, all you'll get from America is words. Those are some of the reasons why the policy of appeasement was pursued. Of course, the question arises, were there any alternatives? Well, of course, there were alternatives. But the real question is, were those alternatives viable? The policy of drift was as dangerous as the policy which Hitler wanted the British to pursue, which was that of alliance with Germany. A policy of drift would ensure the alienation of France, Italy, possibly even the United States. It would lead Britain down a blind alley. It was never seriously considered. The policy of alliance with Germany was seriously considered in quarters where Nazism was more appreciated, but not in governing circles, not seriously, anyway. The danger of a policy of alliance with Germany was that it would simply deliver the continent to Germany. What would happen to the British Isles, to the British Empire, if Germany became master of the continent? Could Hitler's word be trusted that he would permit Britain to be mistress of the seas and to concentrate on its empire. Another alternative might be the policy of collective security. As I said earlier, the League of Nations had inspired many people in the 1920s. It solved a series of minor international disputes quite successfully. Uh, but by the 1930s, certainly by 1936, after the Italian occupation and conquest of uh, Abyssinia, it uh, had no credibility whatsoever left. Chamberlain was at least realistic enough to recognise that. I've spoken a little bit about the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, added to the 
dangers of an association with Soviet communism was the fact that Russia was perceived as wholly unreliable. Um, in the 1930s, for instance, mid-1930s, there were military purges in Russia. How credible, therefore, was Russia as a potential military ally against Germany? Before we get to Chamberlain, um, you'll notice that we've not mentioned Chamberlain since the start of this talk about appeasement. Um, let's look at some examples of 1930s appeasement which occurred before the advent to the premiership of Neville Chamberlain. The first was the real eye-opener for the British, and that was the Japanese attack on Manchuria in 1931. Almost immediately, the scales of illusion fell from many eyes in official quarters when it was realised that if Japan meant business and was minded to threaten British interest in the Far East, there was nothing the British could effectively do about it because of military weakness, because of economic weakness, and because of the lack of a strong ally in that region. In 1933, a Defence Requirements Committee report was issued which mentioned Japan as the most immediate enemy as far as British interests were concerned. It also referred to Germany in these very famous terms as the ultimate potential enemy against which British defence preparations would have to be complete before 1939. The Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 1935 is a classic example of appeasement, the redress of a legitimate grievance. Germany had been only accorded a minute navy in comparison to the Tirpitz version in, uh, under the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Hitler came along and asked for 35% by tonnage of the British Navy. It was an offer that was simply too good to refuse. It was an act of appeasement for sure, but it was in the British state interest to accept this offer. A further example of appeasement pre-Chamberlain was the Hall of Alpact. The Hall of Alpact was a shameless attempt to buy Mussolini off by, a court, by awarding him more territory in Ethiopia than he had actually conquered at that time. The reason behind this was that there was a bigger consideration at work. The consideration was that Italy was an essential component in the anti-German front and it was vital to hold on to Italy in order to protect Austria and in order to deter Germany from aggression elsewhere. So these instances of appeasement were all instructive as far as the British were concerned and also had a purpose as far as the British were concerned. Well, let's move on finally to Chamberlain. Chamberlain assumed the premiership on the 28th of May 1937. Um, he hardly inherited a good situation. Anglo-German relations were deteriorating. The Spanish Civil War still raged. Italian naval piracy in the Mediterranean was on the increase. Only two months after Chamberlain's accession, the Japanese reopened their war with China in the Far East. But Chamberlain brought a mission and a purpose to the Premiership, which had really, in terms of foreign affairs, had been lacking under Baldwin. Um, Chamberlain wanted to achieve settlements with Germany and Italy, but particularly with Germany. Um, this brought him into conflict, first of all, with his foreign secretary, with Eden. Eden believed that it was not wise to make concessions to the dictator states without previously securing in advance credible guarantees, a deal worth making, if you like. Uh, Chamberlain, on the other hand, believed that simply the time was running out and it was essential to come to terms with the dictators as soon as possible. Um, Chamberlain's career is effectively dominated, as Prime Minister anyway, is effectively dominated by the Munich crisis. This is supposed to represent the classic case of submission, the most craven 
submission to dictators. The questions always asked, was Czechoslovakia a better cause for war than Poland? And it's often argued that that is the case. For one, it was a stronger state in many respects. We have to put ourselves in the context of the time. Could Great Britain have been persuaded to fight Germany in 1938 because of a dispute over supposed legitimate grievances about the denial of self-determination in the Sudetenland? Of course, that was only a cover as far as Hitler was concerned. But as far as Chamberlain and the British government was concerned, those were the issues at stake. It's clear, obviously, that in the longer term Hitler wanted to destroy Czechoslovakia. But was that evident in 1938? Self-determination was the big issue. Also, judged on its merits at the time, what British interest would have been served by fighting Germany to save Czechoslovakia? Could the public be persuaded to fight. As Chamberlain said, Czechoslovakia was a faraway country. This was a dispute between people of whom we know nothing. There were also problems in 1938 with the Dominions. Could the Dominions be persuaded to fight for Czechoslovakia? No, was the answer. You couldn't have the impossible situation of half of the British Empire at war and the other half not with Germany. These are all additional factors to the ones I've previously mentioned about economic weakness, about the military deficiencies, etc. Munich was hardly peace with honour, but it was peace. And if nothing else, it bought Britain a breathing space. Um, in particular, that breathing space was used to consolidate the air defence of Great Britain and the RAF, which was crucial to the survival of these islands in 1940. Appeasement was finally abandoned in March 1939. Um, to be sure, Chamberlain, after Munich, had been guilty of over-optimism. He had not heeded the warnings of the intelligence services or the Foreign Office about Hitler's ultimate ambitions and intentions. But the guarantee to Poland was nonetheless a radical departure in foreign policy. And this was an attempt to deter Hitler from further aggression and to maintain the European balance of power, which was the primary British interest on the continent. Finally, it's worth just asking the question, was appeasement foredoomed to failure in the German case? The answer to that is probably yes. Hitler's ambitions were effectively uncontainable. How could British policymakers be expected to understand Hitler. Hitler's worldview was conditioned by the idea that an international Jewish conspiracy was pulling wires behind the scenes, especially in Moscow and Washington. Hitler's mission was to destroy that conspiracy, initially by invading the Soviet Union. This would also satisfy Germany's quest for Lebensraum, but the war was going to be an ideological war. It was perhaps a bit of a stretch to expect the likes of Baldwin and Chamberlain to understand the vastness of Hitler's visions and the impulses which drove him along. Quite apart from that, Hitler never evinced any interest whatsoever in general European pacification. Hitler was interested in parceling out the world, specifically in uh, conjunction with the British Empire. Um, but as I've said before, there were very great doubts about the wisdom of that, um, as far as Britain was concerned. So Hitler was never interested in the pacification of European issues, in the piecemeal settlement of disputes. The three efforts which were made in the 1930s to conciliate Hitler by the British Foreign Office all failed miserably. He was not interested, therefore, in the so-called general settlement which it was a hope that appeasement might ultimately deliver. So throughout the 1930s, uh, Hitler just simply refused to be deflected from his colossal ambitions. That's effectively why the appeasement of Hitler failed, or one of the main reasons anyway. But what guarantee 
is there that any other policy would have succeeded? And the question has to be asked, what other policies were available at the time?